We're happy that you're able to be with us. And we're very honored and privileged to have uh, Miriam Krupka, our Dean of Faculty and a master teacher in the Ramaz Upper School, um, who will be uh, delivering the first um, of our classes, the, the Ramaz classes of the day. Um, her class this morning is entitled Echa, translating a poetry of grief. As usual, uh, Miriam brings to her teaching so many new and exciting elements. And on a Tisha B'Av like this, we all do need um, both new views and new ways to view things, to see things and to understand things. And so we thank you in advance, Miriam, for what you're bringing to us. And once again, I hope that you will continue to be with us for the other classes of the day and for our other virtual learning uh, that we bring to you through our uh, Ramaz Alumni Association. And once again, thank you everybody for being with us and I hand it right over to Miriam. Uh, thank you, Kenny, so much. Thank you for inviting me. I know we tried to make this happen last year and we couldn't do it. So um, really nice to be here. Um, I see a lot of really wonderful, familiar faces here. Shout out. I think I saw Lewis there. I know you get a little belated mazel tov. Um, I've been following those adorable pictures on Facebook. Um, and also thank you uh, to my mother-in-law who's here, but is downstairs watching my kids. So if she's in and out, I will not test her on this later. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, really just thank you to uh, Karen and Gabriel Slotnick, who are sponsoring the year in memory of Pesach Yehoshua ben Yosef Mayer Zetzal, and also to Grace and Charles Korn, who are sponsoring in memory of Margarita Cohen. So uh, let's begin. I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen with you in a moment so that we can you can get some uh, visualization of what it is I'm talking about. But I really want to try. My goal for our next 45 minutes is to take a text. Um, which can be often very dry, very difficult, um, very dense. Uh, a text that we all sat and listened to uh, last night. And I want to try to give it a little bit of context, not really historical context, but more emotional context. We'll see what I mean as we head to the end. So that if you pick it up again this afternoon or when you sit down next year to read it, it, it hits you with a little bit of a different um, shaping. So what is Echa? Echa is one of the five Megilot. Uh, the five Megilot is a very generic term. The, the, the five of them really have very little to do with each other as a unit. There are different halachic genres, right? Some we do say a bracha on, some we don't. There are different time periods. They were canonized into Tanakh at different times. We decided to read them in shul at different times. The first time we ever see them grouped together is kind of um, early 1000s in the Leningrad Codex. And many say that they were grouped together um, only because they we, we read them all out loud in shul. So at one point they wanted to kind of put them in one place. So that this was the book you would take, you could keep in shul or take back and forth to shul. But otherwise, they're you know they're very different, um, very different books, different literary genres. Um, and the way that Eicha really kind of stands apart from the other four Megillot, so Rut, Shir Hashirim, um, Esther, Kohelet, is that Eicha is a lament in the form of lyric poetry. And we're going to get into a little bit what that means. What does that mean? That is ly lyric poetry. What is lyric poetry? Lyric poetry is usually translated as a transferable experience experience. Okay, so we're going to come back to that. And if you think about the other Megillot, Esther is a narrative with a plot, right? So is Ruth. Shir Hashirim is, you know, really beautiful, sometimes inspirational love poetry. Kohelet is a white, uh, um, a kind of drier form of wisdom literature. And Eicha kind of stands in opposition to Esther and really to all of them because it's really about mourning. Um, Eicha is a little different than the book of Jeremiah, and I want to talk about that also a little bit later in a moment. Um, your Miyahu's book is what we call literally, a, it's, a, it's a literary genre called the Jeremiad, named for um, the book Jeremiah, which laments the state of society and its morals. It's very moralistic. It's the wrath of God. Think uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God, right? The sermon by Jonathan Edwards in 1741. That sermon is in the genre of a Jeremiad because it's very wrathful and moralistic, fire and brimstone, etc. That's the book of Yirmiyahu. Eicha is different. Eicha and Yirmiyahu are both written by Yirmiyahu, but Yirmiyahu, the book of Yirmiyahu is a Jeremiah. It's angry, it's wrathful, it's moralistic. Eicha is not. Right off the top of our heads, we might think, wait a minute, Miriam. Yes, it is. I just heard it last night. It's also angry and wrathful and moralistic. But I want us to really look at and realize today is that Eicha is less wrathful and more lyric 
And that's what we're really kind of kind of looking a little bit today. So I'm going to share my screen just so we can start. And I'm going to start by um, showing you three very strong tensions that are taking place in the book um, to, um, you know, different things that are in tension with each other. Um, and in order to do that, um, to solve the problem of those three tensions, we'll arrive at what it means that Eicha is lyric poetry and how we're supposed to read it and how we're really supposed to understand it. So uh, here we go. Can we see the sources? We're good here? Okay, so um, let's just get ourselves where we are in terms of history and the events. So the destruction of the um, the Beit HaMikdash in 586 is really obviously Tisha B'Av is about both the destructions of both Batei HaMikdash, but let's start with just 586, the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. Just so we're very, very basic timeline so we know where we are. Um, set around 720 was the exile of the Northern Kingdom, right? So 10 of the Shvatim are gone from, the, from Am Yisrael at this time. Then we have the fall of Nineveh, then we have the rise of Babylonia. Again, these dates are very generic. I just want to get us, uh, give us a sense of this as we move in. The rise of Babel around 605, and then in 586, the destruction of the first temple, and then, you know, kind of your 40, 50 years later, the rise of Persia, and Cyrus allows the Jews to return. So hold on to that moment for a minute. That's where we are in history. Now, I want to talk through three tensions that are taking place in the text that are sometimes not as obvious to a reader unless they're pointed out. Tension number one, Eicha is a book that in all our minds is clearly tied to an event in history, right? I asked my six-year-old, what's Tisha B'Av about? Why do we read this book? Because the, um, the Babylonians destroyed the Beit HaMikdash and the Romans destroyed the second Beit HaMikdash. It is clearly tied to an event in history. It is written by Yirmiyahu, who is tied to that event in history. It is, by the way, Eicha is the culmination of his two other books. Yirmiyahu wrote Sefer Melachim and Sefer Yirmiyahu. Sefer Melachim and Sefer Yirmiyahu are a how we got to here. Sefer Melachim is a history, how we got to here. Sefer Yirmiyahu is a theological, moral, how we got to here, all the things that went wrong as a community. And Eicha is the culmination, right? Eicha is, here we are. We are in this moment now. We are in, you want to know how we got here? Go read the book of Melachim to understand the kings and the, and the historical line. You want to understand how we got here morally, theologically as a community? Go read Yirmiyahu. Eicha is a moment that we are here. We are at the destruction now. But, and this is tension number one, your Miyahu himself is never mentioned in Eicha. And in fact, you can, it seems that they almost don't want you to view it in any sort of historical context because there's no names, there's no dates, there's no historical cues, right? Think about it. The descriptions that are going on in Eicha, right, are really, they're, they're very, they're not generic in that they're describing situations that clearly took place at a certain time, right? But they're not, there are no names or dates or no historical clues. Now, the easy answer that's usually, I want you to understand that as tension number one in the book, um, or kind of the, this back and forth, because there are three tensions we're going to look at that I think all speak to lyric poetry in a very powerful way. Now, there's a very easy answer, right, as to why that is, and that's because Tisha B'Av is not about one tragic event, it's about tragedy in general. It's about suffering, which has affected us continuously in many points of history, geography, societal status. And we wanted, Yirmiyahu wanted the book of Eicha to be an expression of communal history. And though, even though in our minds, Eicha is completely tied to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and Tisha B'Av, right? It's clearly not, it clearly wasn't meant to be just that piece, but was meant to be more general. Fine, great. And that's why, by the way, we have that famous Mishnah, right? If you, I'm going to come back to Ronald Knox's translation in a moment. But if you take a look here at Source 3, we have the famous Mishnah that says that the all the different things that happened on Tisha B'Av, right? There are these five famous events um, that happened on Tisha B'Av. So, Nigzar uh, al-Avotenu So, the, the, the decree after Chet HaMeraglim, the spies, that we wouldn't enter the land is on Tisha B'Av. Um, the temple was destroyed both the first and the second time. Uh, Nilkida Betar. So, Betar was captured, which really marked the end of the Bar Kokhba rebellion once that happened. Um, and the city was plowed. Um, so that's when um, um, Turnus Rufus um, plows the site of the temple and builds the pagan city of the Aelia Capitolina on that site. That was something that in part led um, to the Bar Kokhba revolt. And what's interesting is, is that throughout history, there are lots of events tied to Tisha B'Av, right? Uh, the first crusade declared in 1095 on Tisha B'Av, the expulsion of the Jews from England in 1290, uh, from Spain in 1492. If anyone, this is a tangent, if anyone's interested, the Alhambra decree um, expelling the Jews from Spain was actually issued on March 31st. It gave them three months to leave until July 31st. And then, but when you look at it, you're like, wait, 
this is actually a gap of 11 days. They didn't have to leave on Tisha B'Av. Um, but if you could take into account the Gregorian Reformation in 1582, which was an 11 day addition to the calendar, it actually was the day that they actually had to leave Spain was Tisha B'Av. There's lots of papers written on this, but it is interesting that there's been this almost like desire, right? World War One starts in 1914 uh, when Britain and Russia declare war on Germany. And there's almost like a gimmicky game almost that we play in history where we do everything we can to kind of tie all these ideas to, to Tisha B'Av. And the Gemara is doing it here and it's not gimmicky, right? It's all the things that happens on that day because like Yirmiyahu's writing of Eicha itself, it's an attempt to make the pain of the day ubiquitous, right? When we say we don't need to create, and this, this sometimes even politically it plays out. Like there was a little bit of um, some of the political infighting that occurred around, let's say, the creation of Yom HaShoah was about people saying, wait, we don't wear, we don't make days for every tragedy that Jews have. We have Tisha B'Av, we have our keynote on Tisha B'Av. Each kina, you want to add a kina for a new event, that's great. But as Jews, we take this day, we take this moment and make it ubiquitous in terms of its pain. And that starts with the fact that Eicha is not written tied to any specific event or day, even though in our minds, it really is tied to that day. Okay, point number one. Point number two, literary structure, okay? So the first thing I want you guys to keep in mind, because we're going to tie this all in together, is the idea of the text of Eicha being about ubiquitous grief, okay? Point number two is the literary structure. So as we all know, it's written in an Aleph Bet structure. The first two prakim are three couplets each. Only the first one starts with Aleph. Para Gimel is three couplets, all starting with Aleph, 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 Bet, 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 Gimel, Gimel, Gimel. Para Dalit is two couplets apiece. Five is no Aleph Bet acrostic para but it does use 22 psukim, which is the number of the Aleph Bet. Now, what's really and then here I just threw this in. I really wanted you guys to see the Ronald Knox translation. He's an early 20th century English um, Catholic priest. Um, <clears throat> so let's take let's take a moment here um, to kind of, I want to understand the importance of the acrostic language. So this is Perak Gimel. This is the beginning of, of Perak Gimel. Ani hagever ra, ani b'shevet evrato, Aleph. Oti nahad v'yola choshech v'lo or. Ach bi yashuv yafoch yado kol hayom. So on the right is the translation of the King James Bible. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Only against me would he repeatedly turn his hand the whole day long. I want you to see the Knox translation on the left, because as you can see, what Knox retained in his translation was the acrostic. So that, it's, I mean, this is about translating poetry, which is very difficult, but he, it was important to him to retain that. And you can see, ah, what straits have I known under the avenging rod? Asked I for a light into deeper shadow. It was really important to Knox, unlike any other translation, and I don't think I've seen any other translation um, that did this. I saw, um, it was interesting, I saw a little piece of Chapter Aleph in another Eicha book that I was reading, and I'm like, oh, this is so interesting, I want to see the whole thing. The amount of time it took me to track down the entire Lamentations translation of Ronald Knox, I think I ended up having to go into some, like, dark reference room only of the Columbia Library, and they wouldn't let me copy it, and I'm like, this does exist anywhere. Can I please just take a copy? But look at what he did. And he did it because he believed that the acrostic structure was so important to the message of the text that if he translated it out, we would lose something. So why, right? Why is the acrostic structure so important? Because by the way, he sacrifices other things, right, on the altar of the translation. He doesn't get the perfect translation structurally, syntax in other ways, so that he can keep and maintain the acrostic. And the reason that he that he does this, right, um, it's is um, is because this is a very important piece of the of the value of the book. Why? Why is the acrostic structure such an important piece of the value of the book? And here's tension number two, because the 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 structure of the book is in direct contrast to the chaos of the text itself. The text itself is chaotic. It is about shattered paradigms of the time. It is about total pain, chaos. We're going to look at that text in a moment. There is no structure to what is occurring emotionally at this moment, what is occurring theologically at this moment, what is occurring to the community. The acrostic is in direct contrast. It has structural value. It's holding the text together in the absence of a plot. The poem itself is very fra fragmentary, but the structure is A, B, C, D. You don't get a more consistent structure, right? So on a theological, psychological level, the poet is using language as his means of expression, right? And what he's basically doing is saying that one of the ways I'm going to express 
the poetry here is not just through the anguish of the words, but for some reason, I'm also going to make this a very simple structure. And lots of people talk about why that is. Maybe it's a form of consolation. Like I know the world seems crazy right now, but A, B, C, this is the basics of communication. We all know this, it's gonna be okay, right? Maybe it's a crit uh, criticism, maybe it's a critique. Maybe it's look how far you guys have come from when you left Egypt and you, the, the people that you became, the society, the culture that you became. And now we're just like back to our ABCs. Like we're just back to the simplest form of existence because look at what we've done or what has happened to us, right? So. It's, um, you, you, there are a lot of ideas about why that's there, but the acrostic is an important part of the text and it's intention, right? So tension number one, this is tied to an event, this book, but it's also about everything, about all pain. Tension number two, the book itself is, is fragmented and chaotic and pain, and yet the literary structure of the book is kind of the simplest, calmest, most structured type of verse you can use, right? Like my son does this, like E-T-A-I, E is for excellent, right? It's like almost simple and childish in its, in its structure and in its format. So tension number two, the chaos of the text versus the choice of the order in the way it was written. Okay, so that's point number two. Point number three, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll try to see how all three are feeding a very certain type of, of, of expression. Let's start just with a little bit of a deeper understanding of the time period. I tell my students all the time that I think you can make the case that this was the strongest, most terrible, largest, kind of most impactful turning point in Jewish history, because at one in one time, they lost land, king, and religious center. So we think, oh, the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, but think about it. They lost their land. They were kicked out of their land. They lost their sovereignty, their king. This is the end of the Davidic dynasty, right, along with that. And they lost their Beit HaMikdash. Uh, there were no, there was no such thing there as, you know, weekly Shabbos shuls there. The Beit HaMikdash was the center of religion. There was, there wasn't really a concept of how we, and I think it's so crazy sitting here now, I think a lot of us can relate much more to the idea of what happens to religion when you shut down shul, right, after the experience we've all had. But here, they were almost like, think of that moment when we first heard the shuls were going to shut down and we were like, what? Like, and this is that times a thousand, they completely lost the Beit HaMikdash. There was, that was everything, the, the center of their religion. Think about the, the biblical descriptions of how they celebrated anything, right? It was the Kohanim and it was the Beit HaMikdash. So they lost religious center, political sovereignty, and their land all at one time. And here's the most important part. Nobody thought this could happen. No one. They were convinced, and I'm going to show you, they were convinced that Jerusalem was inviolate, was indestructible, not only physically, okay, but that it was God's house, which could not be touched. So let's kind of run through here for a minute so I can, um, so I can show you. Um, Yirmiyahu's famous speech in Parak Zion, where he implores them, I know you think this place can't be destroyed. I know you think it's the strongest, most central element of our culture, but I promise you, if things, you're lying to yourselves. You, yeah, this is his famous Pasuk and Pasuk Dalid right here at the top of page two. When you tell yourselves, this is the Heichal Hashem and it will last forever, you are, you are lying to yourselves, right? There are all these other things that are, um, you know, that are coming into play that are gonna, that God is not happy about and you're lying to yourselves. And then you look through the history of the way Am Yisrael understood Har Habayit and the Beit HaMikdash. This is just one example from Tihilim, right? Gadol Hashem Mulama Ode Be'ir Eloheinu Kar Kacho. I look at the final Pasuk Tet. Ka'asher Shamanu Kain Ra'inu Be'ir Hashem Tzvakot Be'ir Elokein Elokim Yechonu Ne'a Ad Olam Sela. This place will last forever. It was part of their psychology. It was part of their religion. Incidentally, it's also part of the religion of the ancient Near East, right? There was a very strong belief that the gods, gods relied on the temple. They needed it. It was the place that they lived. They would destroy everything else, but they wouldn't destroy their temples, right? So there was this just idea that Yerushalayim was mythological. Nobody could touch it. And remember that when the Northern Kingdom was destroyed, was taken away by Assyria, they got really close to Jerusalem. They came and then they couldn't get through to Jerusalem. So they had historically, militarily, you know, philosophically, theologically, everything they knew. Temple had been around for a really long time. Everything they knew about their history, about their Tehillim, about their language, about their history, pointed to the fact that Jerusalem could not be destroyed. This place will always be protected. No matter how bad it gets, it's gonna be okay. So now we have a community that has lost everything. They've lost their religious center, they've lost their land, they've lost their political sovereignty. And with everything came a complete collapse of meaning. 
a complete feeling that everything they had believed in was gone, dealing with the question of God's abandonment. They just didn't know how to contend with the idea on the one hand, they had believed in this strong, omnipotent, loving God. How could this happen? I would almost say it was the birth of theodicy, right? The birth, I mean, we thousands of years later, I think have dealt with this question very often, but when you're looking at a community that had known, they, they had seen tragedy, but they, these were the things that they deeply believed in. They had never really experienced God's abandonment. The Northern Kingdom was explained away with, well, they were awful. They deserve this. God told them for hundreds of years already that if they didn't improve, this would happen. But everything had had an explanation until now. And now there was just, how could this happen? Right? What happens to the covenant now? What happens to the Brit? The Brit was all about getting us to Eretz Yisrael and getting us to the Beit HaMikdash. Well, that's all gone now. How do you deal with the question of God in the face of total tragedy and total abandonment when it occurs on such an intense level, everything they had ever known, and when psychologically it went against everything they had known and believed in? So the tension, the third tension I want to deal with in the book is, is Eicha trying to answer that question. And here's where we're going to go into the text for a little bit. Is Eicha a theodic book or is it not? And when I say is it a theodic book, so theodicy is from the Greek theos meaning God and daiki meaning justice. Well, the, theodicy means creating an understanding, right? Um, God, what is God's justice, right? Some say that it's any attempt to make human suffering intelligible, right? So is, the, is Eicha a theodic book? Is it trying to answer the question of how could this have happened? Is Yirmiyahu trying to explain it to them? Or is it an anti-theotic book? And we'll talk about what an anti-theotic book. So Eov, right, Job, is clearly a theotic book. There's so much in there that's just trying to deal with how could this bad thing happen to this good person? And it's clearly dealing with that. But Eicha, it's not so clear. And there's actually arguments amongst commentators about whether or not Eicha is a theodic book, or if you're a bad person, <laughs> if you think that Eicha is a theodic book, and it's absolutely an anti-theodic book. Okay, why? Like, why, why can't I think it's theodic or not? So here we go. Um, let's, we're, this is where we're really going to jump into Eicha um, for a little bit. So the, let's go with the argument that it's a theodic book. It is answering the question to a traumatized people, how could this happen, okay? Let's say it's a theodic book. Well, you've got a lot to rely on if you think Eicha is a theodic book, because honestly, all of Devarim, Sefer Devarim, operates theodically in what we call a retributive moral framework. If you listen to God, you will have the land and you will have the Beit HaMikdash and everything will be okay. If you do not, you will get kicked out of the land. So one answer to theodicy is what we call a retributive moral framework, which is this happened to you because you did bad. Had you not done bad, this would not have happened to you. This is not an answer to theodicy that is very utilized or acceptable or okay at all in the modern world. So we're going to stick with biblical times for a minute, right? We don't walk into people and say, I don't know, this horrible thing happened to you. What did you do? You must have done something. So retributive moral framework is a very biblical um, um, even the prophets use it a lot. Once we move out of biblical times, we, we, we don't really see a retributive moral framework in Jewish um, philosophy anymore. And it makes sense because we no longer have access to the way God is thinking. So it would be very stupid for us to assume that God did something to anyone because of a reason. So we rely more on we don't know the reason, right? But Devarim, as you can see, it's all over the place. If you start looking for this in Haftorahs and in, and in Tanakh, you'll see this idea of Then I will give you all these things. But if you don't, do what I tell you. God will be angry and you will, you will be kicked out of the land. It's so clear in Devarim why you get kicked out of the land, right? Because you did bad things. And the truth is you see hints of retributive moral framework all over Eicha. So for example, um, Eicha Perak Aleph Pasuk Hei. Hayut Sareha Lerosh Oideha Shalu. Right? So her adversaries have become the head, her enemies are attacking her. Ki Hashem Ogal Al Rov Pisha Why are all these happening? Because, because God has afflicted her for the multitude of her sins. Uh, there you go. Eicha is a theodic book. It is telling the people, this is happening to you because you have sinned. Perachet. Chet chata Yerushalayim al-kein l'nida 
really simple. This Asa is not only a theodic book, it is a theodic book that is answering theodicy with the retributive moral framework of this is happening to all of you because of all the things that you have done. And there's a whole bunch of other examples. Um, Pasuk Yudchet, also Tzadiku Hashem, Kipihu Mariti, even the people understood this is happening because we've rebelled. This is why um, this is happening um, to us. So Tavo Kol Ra'atam Lefanecha, there is wickedness. This did happen. Pasuk Hafet in Tarek Aleph because Am Yisrael sinned. And really, if I told you just find all the Psukim and Echa that are about this is happening to you because of your sins, you could probably come up with 10 to 15. Uh, Perak Bet Pasuk Yedalid. I think I threw it on here. Let's see. Or maybe not. Um, it's also about that this is happening to you because you sin Parak Gimel, Pasuk Lamatet, um, Parak uh, para Gimel, Pasuk Membet. This is that we are answering theodicy with the idea that this happened to you because you sinned. Now, there's another answer for why Echa might be a theodic book, and that's something that we call educative theodicy, which is the reason that bad things happen to good people is because through this pain, the sufferer gains a better understanding of his life. He becomes a better person. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, you come out thinking about something differently or experiencing something differently or having developed into something differently. So that's a second theodic answer. One is, well, this happened to you because you sinned. One is, no, 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 you didn't do anything wrong, but God put you through this because you're coming out in a certain way that's systematically stronger. And the truth is that's actually all over Eicha as well. So almost all of Parak Gimel is this kind of theodicy. Parak Gimel, the, the, the middle section of Parak Gimel, Yudchet through Chafbav, is basically a reasoned reflection on misery, right? And is talking about how is this going on? I'm worried. I'm thinking if you take a look here at, at, at he's struggling with this, right? So if you look at Parak Yudchet, Omar, Avad, Nitzchi, V'toch, Altime, Hashem, Zechor, Ani, Umi, Rodi, La'anav, Arosh. I'm thinking about what I'm going through and I'm trying to understand it. And and then I finally arrive at a conclusion in Chafalev, Zot Ashiv Elibi Al Keno Chil. The more I think about what I'm going through, I arrive at a place that I can have hope because Chaste Hashem Kilo Tamnu, I know he's still there for me. It's this reasoned reflection. It's, it's a soulful thinking through, what am I going through? Why am I here? What is this, right? Well, okay, maybe that's an answer to theodicy. God puts you through this right? They're, the reason God puts you through this is so that you can kind of think this through in a thoughtful way. All right, so for those two, and, and most medieval commentators took this view, the Alshech, etc., um, that, that, that the book is theodic, right? That there is a reasoning through of why a bad thing happens. And then you have the approach that the book is absolutely not theodic. The book is anti-theodic. Anti-theodic means a denial of any attempt to justify, explain, or accept as meaningful the relationship between God and suffering. So not there's an answer and I don't know it, that we are not even going to attempt this here, right? That this book is not about thinking through reasoning. And of course, I'll have to ask, well, then what is it about, right? Now, this is, to say the book is anti-theodic is a radical change in thinking for anyone who studied the Nevi'im or even the Torah, because we're built on a very deuteronomistic way of thinking, right? Schar onesh, do good, God will be good, right? And the, um, the, here are the few reasons given for why the text can't be theodic. You may not view the text as trying to deal with an answer for the suffering. It has to be viewed as a denial of any attempt to justify, explain, or accept as meaningful the relationship between God and suffering. So I, I often, when I start this anti-theodic look at Eich, I think of a famous statement. I don't remember where I saw it, but it's attributed to Rabbi Irving Greenberg, Yitz Greenberg, where he believed, he got very upset at some of the philosophies post-Holocaust that tried to explain how could this be? Well, maybe, look, we got the state of Israel and look at that, 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 that. And he, he had a statement that I saw quote, attributed to him in a book once that said, you do not talk the Odyssey in a room with burning children. Meaning when a community is in pain, when someone is suffering, you do not ask the theodic question. You just take in the pain. You allow the anger to simmer. You allow the accusation, the hatred, the I want to walk away from God. You let all of that go. You deny any attempt to find any meaningful connection because you don't talk the Odyssey in a room with burning children. And this is the approach to Eicha that is anti-theodic. So first of all, where do we see in Eicha that there's an attempt to make the book anti-theodic? Number one, the intense anger and the intense accusation at God that is in the book. This is a person who is experiencing something deeply, deeply painful right now. 
and you don't talk the Odyssey in a room with burning children. You are letting this person feel the pain. So first of all, this very intense anger that seems to deny reason, right, or claim absence to reason. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, Parag Bet. Up to came Aleph and Bet. It um and I'll, I'll just talk um um the word Eicha by the way is often used as a um a you're asking it rhetorically. So this idea Eicha Yaiv Ba'apod and I Abatzion and Shlich Mishmai. How is this happening? How has God taken his beautiful daughter and cast him down? This is not us actually asking how. Tell me how this happened, God. That's the book of Yirmiyahu and the book of Malachim. Eicha is just this expression of anger, right? You've just, you've, you're like, what is going on here? You're literally destroying your own children. What is going on here? It is not a what is going on here as a please explain it to me, the theotic reasons for why this is happening. It is a what is going on here, right? He is completely, you've got, you've completely broken us. The accusation um, that is that is the, the the pain that's going on. And all I have to do is point to the examples in Eicha of the pain of the mothers, the horrible um, scenes of what's happening here. You can't have this type of pain, these types of accusations, the, the starving children, the tears, the, the absolute grief and anger that is flowing through Eicha, that to me, right, or in in um, in, in Parak Gimel, Pasuchet, I always thought this was an interesting one. We're crying and you're not even listening. You're, you're gone. The, the feeling of the individuals in the community in this book are such intense, there's such intense pain. There's such intense anger, accusation, abandonment. Right, think of the end of the book, right? Um, Parak Hay. Um, here, uh, and Nun Bet, I just wanted you to throw in. Um, there is no cause. There's quite a few places in Eicha where the speaker is saying, I don't see a reason here. This doesn't make sense. The, and of course, why? Why are you doing this to us? So the, 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 the grief and the pain and the anger and the accusation and the abandonment, all three of these seem to deny a sense of justice and they're denying a search for justice, right? It's a focus because the anti-theotic approach to Eicha claims that one should focus on the experience of the pain rather than on the analysis of the cause, right? It's not about figuring out how we got here. It's about we are sitting in something really, really awful right now. And you know what? Maybe it's because we sinned or maybe it's because it educates us. But in the end of the day, none of that works and none of that is fair. And really, in the end of the day, all that stuff is ridiculous. When you sit where I am right now and you experience what it is that I am going, it is, it is, it is, it's, it's, um, it's what one scholar calls moving from between confession to complaint to abandonment. It's like, I don't know what we did. Why are we doing this? And a, another major piece that often points to the anti-theotic is that often scholars and commentators point to the fact that Sion is often portrayed as a grieving, violated woman and as a victim rather than a perpetrator, right? If you want to say the answer to what happened here is that you sinned, what about all the places in Eicha where the people of Yerushalayim are victims? They're not perpetrators, right? There, and there's, all you feel is the pain of what happened. You're not given a sense of like this happened because you sinned. It's like lightly mentioned and then the author runs away from it. So the the, the the idea that there's so much pain that there's no access to any comforting image of God at all, right? It's not exactly a Jeremiah on the one hand, but all you feel is the pain. I mean, the book is all you feel is the pain. And that, says the anti-theotic camp, is the problem with the theotic message. It doesn't hold up, right? There, are, Yeah, there's some references to sin here and there, but for the most part, again, Green, you know, Rabbi Greenberg, no statement theological or otherwise should be made that would not be credible in the presence of burning children. That was his exact quote, right? How can you start with the Odyssey when you're sitting in a book that that is that is explaining this situation in ways that you know, unfortunately, we have modern day examples we can point to. You don't, you don't write a book about the Odyssey when you're sitting in the middle of a Holocaust. Like that would be the anti-theotic kind of approach. So tension number one, the book is about an event, but it's ubiquitous. Tension number two, the book is chaotic, but it has this very simple structure. Tension number three, is Eicha trying to deal with the Odyssey or not? Can you find an answer to pain in the book? Or are you not supposed to be looking for an answer to pain at all? In the book. You're just supposed to be kind of taking it in. So with that full setup, I want to talk through a couple of purposes of the book that I think take all three of these things into account. So purpose number one, Eicha, is about giving the human being a voice. 
It is giving a voice to anger. It is a book that is not supposed to be about God's perspective. It is a book about man's perspective. Most of Tanakh is God's perspective. It's God telling us what he thinks, what we should do, how we should be better, what the right kind of life is. But Eicha, um, and this is a beautiful piece I saw um, from Chaim Angel, it's actually his description of the book of Kohelet. Um, he believes Kohelet was the, an anthropological book, the book of the human experience, what it means to be human. And I'm gonna apply this to all the Megillot because I think really all five of the Megillot, and maybe this is one of the reasons we read them out loud as a community, are about elevating a human emotion, a deeply felt human emotion and giving that emotion um, almost elevating it, canonizing it, giving it a place in Tanakh and giving it a voice. So um, what, what Rabbi Angel had said about um, about Kohelet is that prophecy was committed to changing society so that it would ultimately match the ideal messianic vision, right? Prophecy insists all of human history is a line that we're getting somewhere good and we're doing everything in our power to move that process along. Prophecy makes sense. Human perspective doesn't make sense. I might know that that's the ideal thing, but I wake up in the morning or something bad happens, or I look around and I say, I don't understand this world. I think it sucks. I don't think we're moving towards a messianic era. I think bad things happen and I don't understand them, right? So what Rabbi Angel said about Kohelet is that it needed Kohelet to represent the confusion. Kohelet's about confusion of the human perspective. And then we need prophecies so that there are moments that we can transcend ourselves and our limited perspective. But if Eicha is about the human condition of pain and anger and fear, right? Pain and anger at abandonment and at loss. Then the book is here, right? Not that the, the, and the primary role of the book, the prominent role here of the lament and the complaint, right? Is not that not only do we tolerate human input, we require it. It is our responsibility as a community to bring our concerns, our pain and suffering, right? Before the throne of God to say out loud, we are in pain, we are, an we are angry. And we do that as a community. We sit there, we say this out loud, right, as a community, and we give voice to the expression of grief, right? So if we look at it, right, it's very, um, it's a kind of making anger a legitimate stance, right? It's not the only stance. And your Yermiyahu is not willing to not say we didn't maybe, on the one hand, deserve it on a certain level. But the idea that through this book, we are giving anger a legitimate stance in our community and in our canon, right, that's what that's what this is there for. Now, I've always liked that idea and I thought it was an interesting one, right? Um, and part of that, by the way, is because we're giving it a voice, we are allowing ourselves to work through the pain, right? So you have all these different ideas of kind of the role of language and the role of poetry. Um, the Haney piece I really love the most in Source 8, when a poem rhymes, when a form generates itself, when a meter provokes consciousness into new postures that is already on the side of life. Once you write something down, you make it a text, you make it lyric poetry, especially lyric poetry with this transferable experience, you're not only allowing the anger and the voice of grief to have a voice, you're also helping people work through it, right? We're expressing it. Why do we have Shiva visits, right? Because it's not just that we're letting the morning be there and we're having it together, but the person is talking. They are, they are working it through. We're talking it through together. Why is, you know, Aviva Zorber talks about this so much. This is the psychological model, right? Why, when you're going through something, are you supposed to talk about it? Go to someone who can help you because just saying it out loud gives it legitimacy, gives it a stance, gives it value, and also allows you as a community to start to work through it. So it's like two steps. It gives the anger and the pain, um, you know, um, a voice, it's a vocabulary for grief, right? It's not necessarily about grievance, it's more just about a poem of grief expressed. People are living on after a calamity, not by repressing their grief, but by being able to express the horror in which they lived. And Eicha is a vocabulary for that grief, right? Um, but ultimately, I think if you really want to understand the different um, the different pieces that are in that are in each of these three that we set forth. I don't think it's just about giving anger a voice and giving anger and pain um, and theological confusion a voice to work through. But the question still remains with how do you explain then the mess of the theotic versus the anti-theotic, right? The, the, the theodicy is still in there. There does seem to be an answer. Are we avoiding it? Or are we not? And, and I think that ultimately the beauty of what lyric poetry is, is that lyric poetry relies on the fact that there is no narrative, there is no unity, 
and that it is actually just taking chaos and putting it into language. So if you're putting chaos into language, then it makes sense that it's theotic and anti-theotic because whenever something bad happens, right, we look at it and we're like, well, I don't know, maybe I did do something. Maybe, what caused this? How did it happen? Part of the chaos of dealing with pain is that you do say, was there a reason? Was there not? So instead of putting statements at the end of each sentence in Eicha, you're really putting question marks. Like, was it because is it because God? No, it can't be. This child is dying. I'm just angry at you. It's a mess of the theodicy and the anti-theodicy because the lyric poetry that is trying to take anger and give it a stance is also trying to play out for you what are all the different modes of expressions that are happening here, right? So it's meant to, to make it as confusing as you can because it's the monkey mind, right? It's the jumping from place to place. Like on one day I wake up and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna work through this. This is educational. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I'm gonna go through here meows paragimel. Uh, this is because I have to work on my relationship with God and you feel calm. And then two hours later, you're hysterical crying and, and, and you don't understand and you hate God because that's what anger and terror and chaos is about. It's about a transferable experience, trying to transfer an experience, but trying to transfer an experience of, of chaos. And the, the language of the book very often is also go moving back and forth between poetry that is consistent and that is repetitive and rhymes and poetry that is all over the place. Let me give you one example. Um, there's a lot of... Um, euphony in the book, which is harmonious sound patterns. So Perak Aleph Tetvav is like a kind of, is a good one to, to look at. They're, the book keeps switching back and forth between repetitive, nice, calming rhyme, like the acrostic, and, 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 um, and poetic methods that are less calm and that are less structured. So let's see, Tetvav, maybe I put it here on the bottom, because then we would get to it later. No, so go to Perak Aleph Pasuk Tetvav. Um, let me look it up because it's a good one, um, which is a good example. So hold on. Let me, if any, if any, here, let me look it up for you right now. Um, if anyone has it in front of them and wants to unmute and read, that would be good too. Um, it's the, it's the, um, it's where you get that repetition of the I sound. Um, here, let's look. Eicha. Here we go. So Parak Aleph, Pasuk Tevav, is a good example of the rep repetition of the poetry in a very calming way. Um, here. Sila kol abirai, Adonai bikirbi, kara alai moed lishpor bachurai, gam darach Adonai libetulat bat Yehuda, the I, 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 I. So there's this kind of, um, um, this harmonious sound patterns, the emphasis on the I. There's a lot of internal rhyme um, you often see. So Parak Aleph, Pasuk Yud. Yado parash sar al kol machmada, kira ta goyim ba'u mikdasha asher tzivita. Right, but um, there's um, there's a there's a beauty sometimes and a poetry to the way. But then you also have examples of something called enjambment. And enjambment in poetry is when you start to say something and then you leave the sentence in the middle and it seems like you stopped it and like you didn't arrive at a conclusion. So Perak Bet, um, Pasuk Chav Bet is usually a good example of this, um, which is. Um, and again, it's a much kind of tougher, you know, not as not as clear kinds of literary methodology. Right? You called everyone together on this day of fast days. And then it just ends. It doesn't explain why you called everyone here together. It kind of creates this tension because you called us as to a festival and then it stops and then it kind of goes into the second idea and doesn't take you anywhere. So it creates tension by leading the end of the line open with no closure. So even in the, even in the literary aspects of the book, you're seeing this moving back and forth between poetry, and then it's just chaotic lines that don't seem to rhyme and don't seem to have a point or say anything. And that's really the representation of exactly what we're trying to do here, right? Which is this idea that we're a community that can deal with grief 
with together. We're dealing with this grief together. The book itself is trying to deal with answers to that grief. It's theotic and it's anti-theotic. It's about an event and it's not about an event. And the question is that what this is really meant to do is, is give voice, give the community the voice of that grief. And what's really interesting is it goes through all types of grief, right? Perak Gimel is the individual thinker. Perak Aleph is the community. Sorry, Perak Aleph is the outsider looking in. Perak Hay is the communal grief. It's all these different kind of versions of grief that it's trying to pack into one book, right? Aleph is the outsider looking in. Oh my God, this is awful. Gimel is the individual. Hey is we as a community and what we're thinking. And what's interesting is the only voice not heard from is the voice of God, right? It's our language here. And what's really interesting about that is that in Mesopotamian city laments, when a, when a city was being destroyed or a temple or people were being destroyed, it's usually the deity who speaks, right? It's the God that is speaking. And here in Eicha, there is no element of the God speaking. It's all the people speaking, right? It's the idea that we are giving a voice to communal grief. It's not tied to history. It's a universal expression of grief. It's not about answering questions of theodicy. And it's giving us a language of expression. And that language of expression is both the structured acrostic but also the chaos of the text so that you've got both those things together because the experience of grief is that it often feels chaotic and then there are moments of okay this is what we're going to do this is how we're going to react as a community we got this and then we're right back in the chaos so the text itself is wrapping up all these things together in order to give us that language and give and give us that experience um i really just kind of um want to end i mean this is a a, a a beautiful piece about how we use narratives and we use stories to kind of comprehend things um, and that the kind of the most important um, way that we find self-existence and communal existence is through stories. But I was also thinking a lot about um, Orwell in 1984, when you think about this, when you think about the idea, right, um, Orwell's idea that language not only creates meaning, but can create reality, right, that the more we are able to give voice to something, right, um, then the more that thing becomes alive for us, becomes valid for us, becomes a form of something that is deeply felt and understood by the community. Versus if you don't talk about something, it not only leaves the vocabulary, it leaves the reality of the people. And there's something Thing kind of deeply meaningful about the fact that in the writing of Eicha, he, Yirmiyahu was not writing a book that was about, and obviously this is just the famous piece from about Newspeak, right? There would be many crimes and errors which would be beyond his power to commit simply because they were nameless and unimaginable. When you don't name something, it becomes something that actually falls out of not just the vocabulary, but the existence of a people. Once you don't have language for something, it ceases to exist in a certain way. It certainly ceases to exist with complex and nuanced meaning. And the fact that we have this book that is running through so many types of experiences of anger and grief, the structure, the loss, the chaos, the theodicy, the anti-theodicy, the pain, the lack of understanding, um, the, the event that is an event that, you know, obviously spreads out into, forget about just the aspects of Jewish history, any, what it means to be human, right, to suffer with lack of understanding and pain and terror and loss and trauma. And then we said, well, this is really important enough, this human voice, that it needs to become not only part of the canonical language of our people, but it needs um, to be, to be elevated, it needs to be one of the books that are not God, that are not theocentric, that are anthropocentric, that are the voice of humanity, because human beings cannot survive if they don't have the language that these things are felt deeply by the people who are experiencing them. Um, and that's not, I think it's a way to look at all five of the Miggy Load, that they're all stories that are meant to be paradigms for the human experience, that are giving us a language to deal with something deeply significant and real about the human experience, and through that experience to find work ultimately towards some sort um, of comfort and community, even if that's not the point right now in this moment. Um, and and um, I think that's something that we're definitely kind of you know, become very aware of, the idea of language and the sharing of language, and then just really understanding that this that's the, that's the reason that this book is here um, in this way. Um, and in the end of the day, maybe that's why the five Megillot were the ones that were picked to be read out loud in shul. Because you can't have a book that's about giving language to something and then not also add in the element of the language being 
oral and being read out loud. And we can talk about that a whole other time. What changes when a text is read out loud and is experienced together as a community. Um, so all those aspects together, I think, you know, should really help us to think about this day. Yes, it is still a day that encompasses so many terrible things. But if we want to draw some comfort out of it, um, which one could argue I shouldn't be doing now based on, but since we're heading right into Chatzot now, um, I would say that the comfort we draw is that we have texts like this, um, invaluable texts. Um, that we have and that we share together as a community, whether we share them live or we share them on Zoom. Um, and through that, the idea of managing grief and dealing with pain and dealing with trauma is something that our community, unfortunately, has a history with, but has really, really learned how to make part of its vocabulary, its reality, and it, our communal relationships. Um, you know, I, I when I tell people who are not, you know, Jewish about what Shiva is, they're all like, oh, that's incredible, you know, like this, this idea that we come together and we talk or we just sit together and we don't talk, but that we, we, there's no such, there's almost sometimes, maybe sometimes it's a bad thing, no such thing as personal held in grief. It has to be shared with the community. It gets pushed out. Um, and Eicha is the book and the language and the vocabulary by which we push it out. Um, and so with that, as we really do head into the part of the afternoon that is about Nechama, we can take, I guess, a little bit of comfort throughout our history or our personal, you know, um, you know, experiences that we're having that, that a community does have this mode of creating a way of managing and dealing with grief that is about each other, that is about language, um, and that is about shared experience.